So nice to see each and every one of you today. We're going to start um, Defeat the Canaanite. Just to reiterate a bit, um, this whole God's laws of prosperity and success is based on the story of when God took uh, hit the children of Israel out of Egypt and after their 40 years wandering around in the wilderness, he brought them into the promised land. But there were already people in the promised land, enemies, all right, enemies uh, for the life of God and the spirit of God, and they had to defeat them one by one. We're dealing with six of those enemies. We've finished the Amorite, which stands for pride, and the Hittite, which stands for fear. Today, we're going to do the Canaanite, which has to do with covetousness. These, uh, this life in the spirit or entering the promised land, possessing the promised land, it cannot be representative of heaven because there will be no more warfare in heaven. Whereas this definitely is still talking about being here on earth. So it's representing taking over our body, which from the time it's born has been adapting to the ways of the world and taught about the ways of the world and educated that way and taking over these areas where we take over these areas for God and let God, uh, instead of like, um, what was the first one? Pride, Amorite, we learn humility, which to the natural man is nobody likes that. All right, they kind of disdain it and look down on it, but in God's eyes, it is very, very important. And the Hittite representing fear, when we come to God, we don't want to give place to fear because fear X's out faith. We now are to live a life of faith, which gives us boldness in the realm of the spirit uh, to be able to enter the very presence of God. So Toyin, uh, you're going to read to us Ezekiel 16.3, as it says on your notes, remember what the Lord said to Jerusalem. Ezekiel 16, verse 3. And say, thus saith the Lord God unto Jerusalem, thy birth and thy nativity is of the land of Canaan. Thy father was an Amorite and thy mother an Hittite. Yeah, so actually this verse applies to all of us. Your birth and your nativity was Canaan. Our roots come from the natural, the grasping for self, the reaching out, wanting and, and taking for self. Uh, look at every baby, whatever they're, when they're able to move and pick up things, it goes immediately to their mouth. Isn't that right? So in the natural, all of us are born with this trait of grasping for self. So let's go to B. What does the Canaanite represent covetousness? Let us look at Luke 12, 15, because this word, God's word, warns us against covetousness. It says, be careful be on guard, watch out for it. Yes. Twelve fifteen of Luke. Yes, and he said unto them, take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. Yeah, God's word not only warns against it, he lets us know that life is more than things, especially when those things are temporal, all right? Life is very precious, all right? And natural life is very short compared to eternity, all right? 
it's very short, even though people are living longer and longer now because we know how to take care of our bodies better. Yet the most is 100 to a little bit over 100 years, maybe. Um, so life in comparison to spiritual life uh, is natural life is very short. All right. But spiritual life is eternal. And what we need to recognize is life has to be accounted for. What we do in this life, we will give an accounting before we enter into uh, that eternal life, all right? So covetousness can be seen or recognized by the importance of things, all right, uh, in a person's life. Let's put a verse there, Luke chapter 12, verse 16 to 20. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, the ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, what shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, this will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? So we can see here, all right, the way man looks at it, and if you read those verses again, which I'm not going to, but you do it on your own, you see how many my, 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 very self-centered, a life that is self-centered, only thinking of <clears throat> what they have, what they've acquired, what they will have for many years, and taking life for granted. But God sees it totally different. Instead of saying, you're a wise man for you know, thinking ahead, laying up ahead on this life, God called him a fool. The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God, all right? He was not reckoning on meeting God, giving an account to God, <clears throat> using the things that God had given him to benefit others and to help others find out about God. None of that was in his mind. His mind was just solely taken up with self, all right? And um, God called him a fool. So we, number two, we said covetousness can be seen or recognized by the importance of things in a person's life, all right? Um, by the meaning of Canaanite, which is described in the next point. You know, um, let, let's go to that next point. C, possessing or acquiring for self. This is the meaning. Literally in I looked it up in the concordance, all right? Number one, peddler, merchant, trafficker, all right? A a merchandise, making money, interest in things. Merchandise are things to be bought or things to be sold. It's things, all right? Number two, Another meaning for Canaanite is the word humiliated. I didn't make this up. This is literally the, what the meaning of the word is. To bend the knee, humiliate, vanquish, bring down low, bring into subjection. All right. So what we see from this is that uh, 
covetousness brings us into servitude, all right? Where we bow down, you know, we, it sometimes even humiliates us because of the things that men and women will stoop to do uh, in order to gain things. That's all they can think of, all right? Uh, vanquished means, all right, to be submitted or defeated, to bring down low, bring into subjection things, all right? Mammon, all right? Mammon is the god of money because money can buy things. So let's look there at Ezekiel 28, 18. Uh, no, we're going to do earlier than that. We're going to start with 14, even though it says um, 18. We'll start with 14 and read through 16 out of King James. Okay. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou was created till iniquity was found in thee. By the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence and thou hast sinned. Therefore, I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the mist of the stones of fire. This is talking about Satan. There's no one else it can be talking about but Satan, all right? A cherub, uh, meaning like a cherubim, but cherub, usually we think of it as a young cherubim, all right? The, the anointed cherub that covereth. He was the closest of all creation. God created Lucifer, all right, son of the morning, to be the closest to him that literally shrouded the very presence of God. It says, I have set thee so. Who in, you know, of this life had ever been on the holy mountain of God. It was him. He walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Each of those stones was a created being. God is a God of fire. When he created all of creation, all right, and he created these creatures with his nature of as far as fire was concerned. And it says that this one was perfect in your ways. In other words, there was nothing to be added to. He, another portion is found in Isaiah, and it tells how beautiful he was. He was covered with stones, all different kind of precious stones. And you can imagine when he shrouded the presence of God, God's glory shone through him. He literally glittered, all right? And it says, till iniquity was found in him. What was that iniquity? It was covetousness. He began to desire not just to be close to God and let God shine through him. He began to want the position of God. That's what consumed him. He didn't want to be just one that let the beauty and glory of God shine through him. He wanted to be as God. He wanted to take over. He wanted to be above God. All right. And he says in 16, the multitude of your merchandise. So we see that from the position that he had, he fell. And that, that's why it says, I will cast you down as profane. 
out of the mountain of God. I will destroy you, all right, from the midst of the stones of fire. This was King James. I'm going to read to you the English version, all right, it, uh, or the easy to read version. I don't know which it is. T-E-V, anyways. For verse 16, you were busy buying and selling, and this led you to violence and sin. I be, You know how the Bible is. It can talk about things here, and the next thing you know, it's talking about things down there. And I really believe this is really skipped down to after man was created and he, you know, persuaded man to listen to him instead of listening to God and um, began to put within man's heart this desire of covetousness and a desire for what they could see with their eyes. All right, merchandise. But it says, you were busy buying and selling, and this led you to violence and sin. That's the way TEV tells verse 16. And we're going to jump to 18. TEV, you did such evil in buying and selling that your places of worship were corrupted. In other words, things took the place of God. Uh, remember the story I've told you many times of David, who was a weightlifter, all right? And I, it was my turn. He had demons in him. He, his mind had been blown. He would lost his mind uh, when people took him to the Batu Caves. At one time, he was in the organization that I come from. In America, he was on the team for the, the winning team, you know, for those that could memorize the most scriptures. He was on that team. So it wasn't that he didn't know God's word. But anyways, somebody took him to the Batu Caves and the fear that came into him because they left him there. He you know, I had a mental breakdown. That's how he ended up in our house. My husband brought him home. He was a weightlifter in the natural and about 20 so years old. It was my turn to look after him. And I had got him bathed and got his food done and everything. So I brought him out into the living room and got him seated in a chair. And then I needed to run into the kitchen just for a moment. I got as far as the doorway of the kitchen. I got went through the dining room. It's all one big room and we had it divided off. And then there was an entrance into the kitchen. And when I got there, I heard this uh, bang, crash, you know, smash. And I wheeled around in time to see David putting himself back in the chair. I didn't really know yet what had happened. I just knew whatever had made that noise, uh, David had done it. But what it was, was I had this small tape recorder with tapes in it, and it had been given to me uh, because I was taking Tiao Chu lessons to learn how to speak Tiao Chu. I would record my teacher and then go home and replay it over and over. Of course, I had bought other tapes and I had one that was recorded with beautiful hymns. And I had put that tape on this tape recorder and put it on the windowsill across the room from where I put David thinking that it would quiet him and lull him, but the demons in him didn't like that Christian music. and. The moment I got out of sight, he got up out of that chair, took that uh, thing and smashed it onto the ground, my tape recorder. 
And when I came in and saw it on the, because I didn't have a rug on the floor, it, it was a terrazzo on the floor, very hard, pretty, but hard. Um, I saw my beloved tape recorder smashed to smithereens and, and the, the anger that filled me, I walked over to him and I put my finger under his nose. I was trying to keep my cool. I knew that he had demons. So in other words, don't blame David. So I said, I'm not talking to David. I'm talking to those, the one that made David do that, you know, and I was speaking through clenched teeth. I, I was so angry. And the, as I talked, you know, I, I could just sense that I was getting more uh, inflamed. All right. And I thought, boy, I better sit down before I take him and choke him. That was about how angry I had gotten. When I, in those days, money was, uh, you know, it was bigger than it is now in that you could buy a lot more with a little money, but it was harder to get and you just didn't waste money on things, you know. I didn't realize how important things were to me till this event happened. And when I went, oh, I left talking to him and went and sat on a couch. And I remembered that I had been reading a book called Praise the Lord Anyhow. So I thought this is a very good time to try to put that book into practice. So I sat there, oh God, I praise you. I thank you. I worship you. I adore you. Then I started crying and out of the other side of my mouth, oh, my tape recorder. And then I would go back to praising the Lord. And then I'd start crying when I thought of my tape recorder. And after a few minutes of this back and forth, I heard the voice of the Lord. He said very clearly, he said, you are crying over a tape recorder. You can go and buy yourself another one. I am crying over a broken life that can never be mended. It can never make harmony. It can never worship me and praise me until it is put together again and healed. You're crying over things. I'm crying over broken souls. And then I really started crying. Uh, for a different reason, because God had given me spiritual insight. I didn't realize I love things. There I was taking care of him. I'm a missionary. There I am uh, trying to set this captive free. But in my heart, I love things more than I love souls. That's what the Lord showed me. All right. I'm going to ask um, Toyin to read Ezekiel 28, 18 uh, in King James. I read it in TEV. You did such evil in buying and selling that your places of worship were corrupted. In other words, you see, God has made us with a part that's a spirit to worship him. He's made us with a spirit man so that we can, you know, interact with the realm of the spirit and give God what he wants. But sin causes that spirit to be dead. It says you were dead in trespasses and sins. He gave us a body to interact with this world. The problem is the spiritual realm is invisible. And too often we get caught up with the visible and that takes precedence in our life. All right, read verse 18 out of the King James, would you? Ezekiel 28. Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities by the iniquity of thy traffic. 
and therefore will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee. It shall devour thee, and I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. Yeah, I really believe this is probably talking to the Antichrist, ultimately, ultimately. But the Antichrist is also a man, just like Jesus was here on this earth. And I was reading today in the New Testament, in the Gospel of Luke, how the devil tempted Jesus. Uh, it says in all points he was tempted like as we are, we are. And he tempted him just like he tempts all of us, all right, to try to get us to choose to do things his way instead of God's way. And Jesus overcame him in every one of those temptations by quoting the word of God. It is written. It is written. This is what God says. So I can't do what you're asking me to do because God wants me to do the very opposite of this. All right. And so, um, you know, by the multitude of your iniquities and the iniquity of your traffic, trafficking is selling, buying, selling, and, you know, just getting caught up with the things of this life, it says, you defiled your sanctuaries. God made us to be just like him. God made us to be able to fellowship with him. And covetousness will ruin this. It, uh, because God, it says, for God so loved, the world that he gave. Covetousness is, I want, I get, get, get me, 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 all right? But when we come into Christ, just like Jesus gave everything that you and I might be saved, once we get saved, he wants to turn us away from acquiring for self and to learn to be givers. Givers to God, but givers to people to help them to come to God, to meet other people's needs besides ourself. All right. So let's go on here. Um, I told you merchandise are things to be bought, all right, or sold. Let, let's go to this next thing, humiliated, all right? Uh, this is Matthew 6.24 in King James. And then I'm going to read it to you in a couple of other uh, renderings. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he would hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. Yeah, so th that's what the Lord started to show me that day, all right? You can't serve God and mammon, the love of things. The love of things has to get out of you because it will eventually <clears throat> cause you to end up making a choice whether you are going to really serve God or whether you're going to serve things, all right? You can't do both. You cannot. I, I'm going to take um, the easy to read version, ESV. No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money, all right? Um, let's go to Luke 16, verse 13 through 15. All right, put that after Matthew 6, 24. No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, 
or else he would hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. And the Pharisees also, who were covetous, heard all these things, and they derided him. And he said unto them, Ye are they which justify yourselves before men, but God knoweth your hearts, for that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. All right. Money is highly esteemed, all right, among men. But in God's sight, it is an abomination. It is something to be hated when it usurps the position that only God deserves. God is to be first, not money. And when you think of, you know, well, I can't go to church because it would cost me too much. I can't do this because it's too expensive. I can't obey God in this way. And you try to uh, justify yourself. It said the Pharisees, they were a sect of the, they had Pharisees and Sadducees. The Pharisees believed in miracles. They believed in resurrection of the dead. They believed in all those things. It was a very strict sect of the Hebrews, but they were covetous. See, even though outwardly they were so religious and self-righteous. And when they heard what God said, I mean, Jesus said, they derided him, they mocked him, they put him down. What nonsense is he? And that's when Jesus answered them and said, you justify yourself before men. And that's it. People will always think they're right in what they do. They always have a reason why they're doing what they're doing. But let me tell you, no reason can cover if we're doing something that the Bible doesn't agree with. I don't care what your reason is. I don't care why you're doing what you're doing. If the Bible says don't do it, all right? So don't justify your hearts before men. God knows your hearts. God knows when you get right down there. And that's why he said to me, you're crying over a broken tape recorder. I'm crying over a broken soul. You're looking after a broken soul, but you're not crying over that. All the time he's been with you, you never really wept a tear. You took care of him. You watched over him. You prayed over him, but you never wept over him your tape recorder gets broken and you start weeping bitter tears and you're ready to choke the guy and ready to strangle him because you love things more than you love souls. Friends, God sees our hearts. He knows what is in our heart. And though human beings highly esteem wealth, riches, and what money can buy, God says it's an abomination when it takes first place. He's not against riches and wealth. He made Job the most wealthy person uh, in the East. He made Abraham the most wealthy person of his time. God gave them those riches and wealth but it's because they put God first in their lives, all right? But when people go after it themselves and they want it and then they could care less about anybody else, they, they don't really care what God thinks. God says, then it becomes an abomination, all right? I'm gonna read to you Luke 16, 13, to 15 out of ESV, all right? I'm not sure if this is easy to read version or um, I'll, I'll just leave it at that. No man can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one, love the other. He'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. 
I remember one time in a church that we served and uh, in the business meeting, we, we, my husband was very missions minded and, you know, he was getting them to send to all parts of the world. There were some of the places that we sent to, it was very high cost to live there. So some of the board members stood up and said, I suggest we don't send to this place. It's such high cost of living. You have to send more money uh, and we can send to places like Indonesia that's close to us. We can send a lot more money uh, and they can get by on that. I, I stood up. I stood up and I just said, souls cannot be equated with money. You mean because people are born in an area where it costs a lot for a missionary to live there? Uh, let's not support them. It will cost too much. You, can't, you cannot define a soul and the value of a soul with money. No matter what it cost, we were told, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. It doesn't say only go to those places where it's cheaper to go or cheaper to send your missionaries there. It doesn't say that at all. It says go into all the world. Jesus paid the supreme sacrifice. Because God so loved the world. He didn't just love the places that are cheap. He loved all the world. All right. So it says 14, the Pharisees who were lovers of money. Uh, King James said who were covetous. This ESV says the Pharisees who were lovers of money heard all these things and they ridiculed him. And he said to them, you are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. What is exalted among men is an abomination in the sight of God. All right. Um, so let's look here. Let's just read that humiliated again. To bend the knee, it will bring us into servitude, all right? To bow before, to give honor, to submitting to, to be defeated. And that is when money starts taking the place of God, all right? Um, then it will, we will be brought to this place, all right? Let's go down here to number one. All of that was introduction. What is prosperity? The view of the true child of God must be based on God's word. Two, must be different from the world, all right? the true child of God, what is prosperity? It must be based on God's word. Let's um, see this again. Um, 16 verse 15, we just read that. And uh, just a moment here. You, yeah. What is highly esteemed among men is an abomination to God. So we, we have to base things on God's word. Let's see Isaiah 55, verse 8. Isaiah 55, 8. <clears throat> For my thought. Eight and, sorry, 8 and 9, all right. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. All right, now look at verse 9. As the heavens 
are higher than the earth. And you know, there's no way you can reach the third heaven. There's no way. Uh, airplanes, they've learned how to go up into the first realm of the heavens. But nobody's gone beyond that yet. And Jesus told us it takes a ladder. And he is that ladder. Of course, we saw that in Genesis with Jacob when he had that dream. There was a ladder set up. The base of the ladder was on the earth and the top of the ladder was in heaven. God was at the top of the ladder and the angels of God went up and down that ladder. This ladder was connecting earth to heaven. God, God is in heaven. Man is on earth. And the angels could come up and down this ladder. They could go between earth and heaven on this ladder that connected the two. Jesus quoted that when he said, you'll see the angels ascending and descending on the son of man. He is saying, I am that ladder that connects earth to heaven. And by me, you can reach God by me. All right. God is able to reach down to you. So he says, just as heaven is way beyond the earth in the natural, God's ways are way higher than our ways. His thoughts are. So when he says what the earth thinks is very good, all right, uh, he says is abominable. It's hateful. Don't allow money and things to have first place. Only God deserves that, all right? Um, let, let's look here at number two. Um, prosperity in the view of the true child of God not only must be based on God's word, but it must be different from the world. Romans 12, 2. Romans 12, verse 2. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. All right. I'm going to read it to you out of the TEV. Do not conform yourselves to the standards of this world but let god transform you inwardly by a complete change of your mind in other words as you allow god's word and you believe it enough that god's word becomes part of your daily experiential walk you start doing it because you believe in it. You accept it and you will see it starts to change you totally. All right. Be not conformed or poured into the mold. To fashion yourself like the world. You know. I don't know why, um, if, if the way we dress, if the way we do our hair doesn't really, um, you know, how should I say, minimize God or bring God down, then go ahead. And so everybody's doing it, okay? But, you know, God never made man with spiked hair, um, this part red, this part yellow, this part green, this part blue. I've seen people where, you know, they look like they had a bomb put under them and, and then each of these strands are all different colors. God never made anybody like that, all right? 
The other thing is, I'm sorry if I am stepping on toes now. Maybe this is just a pet peeve of mine, but I don't know why people want to follow the world in wearing jeans that have big holes in them. Huh? And especially preachers' wives. I've often wondered why they do that. The picture you're giving, oh no, you can say, everybody knows it's the native style. Well, it's a style that says God's children are poor as church mice. They can't afford a pair of proper jeans. They're full of tears and rips and holes. And you dare to get up on the pulpit and sing to God with looking like that. And you paid more money for those pants than you would for a good looking pair of pants. Honest to goodness, uh, that kind of thinking, you have been poured into the mold of the world. All right. The world has lied to you and you're buying into it. Um, there, there's a group of singers um, from old time, and I love them. I, I, I really love them. But they went through a phase where some of those singers, if I named the, the group, you, most of you would probably know it, where, you know, they, they looked like they had had a night carousing and drinking and their hair hanging in their eyes and, you know, they're dressed nicely and then this hair is, oh my goodness, I thought, don't try to be like the world, you're there to represent God. And I just have a feeling the way God made things so beautiful in this world, um, he wouldn't make things like that. You want to have long hair, have long hair. You want to have short hair, have short hair. But keep it neat if you're going to represent God. Our God is a God of structure, and he made everything proper. You know, he didn't make it long this way, short that way, sticking up that way. Stick. This is the world. Don't fall. You want to follow the world, follow the world as long as it doesn't give the wrong picture of God. That's all I have to say. We are to be like him. All right. Don't be poured into its mold. Don't fashion yourself like rather be transformed, all right, totally changed in appearance, all right, in desires, in appetites, I can't, behavior, yes, and I put on my paper the caterpillar to the butterfly. You know, the caterpillar is really kind of an ugly looking worm. Some of them with hairs on it. it. It's a worm and it crawls and it eats the leaves and it's, it's really down here on this earth. Then it goes into a cocoon. And when it comes out of that cocoon, it doesn't look the same. It doesn't eat the same. It doesn't behave the same. It's a beautiful butterfly. When it comes out, it flies. It eats the nectar of flowers. It is a gorgeous creature. Oh, friends, that's the way God wants us to be. As we allow his word to come into us and our minds to be renewed, and then our lives will start changing. Our thought life will change and our behavior will change. All right. And our desires will change. Our appetites will also change. 
and we will find the things we used to like to feed on, we now don't like to feed on that. We like to feed on the things of God. All right, let's go to B, the world's view of prosperity. Um, is based on riches and wealth, all right? Proverbs 19, verse 4. Proverbs 19, verse 4. Wealth makes many friends, but the poor is separated from his neighbor. Yeah. So... In other words, in this life, if you have money, all oh, you can get, if you're dressed well, if you're this or that, uh, it makes people ooh and awe ah over you. But the poor, they're separate. Nobody wants to be around them because the poor makes them feel uncomfortable. It makes them realize they should be helping them out, all right? I'm going to ask you to put another one, Psalms 39, verse 6. Psalms 39, verse 6. Surely every man walketh in a vain show. Surely they are disquieted in vain. He heapeth up riches and knoweth not who shall gather them. All right. Every man walketh in a vain, empty. It, it's it's putting on a big show. It's a covering. It's not the real thing at all. All right. Uh, he heapeth up riches and he doesn't know in the end who is going to get those riches. All right. Um, it, it's totally, all right, based on money, position and possessions and name, all right? What people will think of us, how to make an impression, that's the vain show, all right? Wealth will make many friends. Um, the Chinese word for prosperity is fa tsai, yeah? To get more, things, tire things, all right, uh, to really, whoa, you just burst out with all these things. That is the way the world sees it. But I'm here to tell you, friends, when we die, and I still remember, I mentioned it one time, but when I read it, it, it was very meaningful to me. When Queen Elizabeth died, all right, her crown was not put in the coffin. Her scepter was not put in the coffin. All right. Her title was not put in the coffin. She was put in the coffin as a mere person, just a person. She left all the wealth and position and things behind. All right. Those do not go into the next world. May the Lord help us. I, I'm going to stop here, mainly just because we have to change paper, all right? And um, when you come back, we'll start on the next page, all right? B2, which is, um, what is prosperity? The world's view of prosperity is based on pride. We'll pick up there and continue. Bye-bye. Come back at, um, let's see, 10.10. 10. Okay, should we come back together again? We're on what is prosperity? B, the world's view of prosperity. All right. Uh, we just finished the one which said, number one, it's based on riches and wealth. And number two, it's based on pride. Proverbs 10, 
15. Proverbs 10, verse 15. The rich man's wealth is his strong city. The destruction of the poor is their poverty. All right, so the rich man's wealth is his strong city. He depends on it. Uh, he relies on it. He feels safe with it. In other words, money is his protection and money is his security. But that next phrase says the destruction of the poor. It isn't because they didn't have um, money. It, the destruction means their souls went to hell. They were destroyed. That was their poverty. It was not it was that they didn't know God. That was their poverty. And um, not because they lacked money. Money cannot take the place of God. And so when the world's view is based on pride, it's like he doesn't need God. Money is his God. Money is his strength. That's what gives him confidence, um, protection, security. He is self-sufficient when he's proud, all right? He, he can satisfy his heart's desire. He can change his circumstances if only he has more money. So everybody wants to get more because they can have more. They can please themselves more. They don't need to depend on God, all right? And let's go to that next one, Proverbs 22, 7. No, did I give you? No, 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 wait. Under A, Proverbs 1, 32. Would you, you don't have it there. So let's. For the turning away of the simple shall slay them and the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. Yeah. So the simple are those that believe whatever you tell them. They don't really try to find out what is wisdom, what is right, what is wrong. They just believe whatever is told to them. And by turning away from God's word and just depending on what people tell them, it will be there. They will be killed. It will slay them. The prosperity of fools uh, destroys them because they act like there's no God. They just depend on themselves, think they can take care of themselves. Nobody can tell me what to do, all right? Um, and th this is wrong. It will end up being destruction. Now let's go to Proverbs 22, verse seven. Proverbs 22, verse seven. The rich ruleth over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. The rich ruleth over the poor. And we have here that he can control people if he has money. All right. Um, I, I want us to look up, and I don't think I have it there. Okay. Put on your paper, now we've, um, he builds his own kingdom, all right? It's based on false security. Let, let's try that, okay? Proverbs 11, 4. Proverbs 11, verse 4. Richest profit in the day of rot but righteousness delivers from death. Yeah. In the day of the wrath of God, it doesn't matter how, in fact, if you go and read what the Bible has to say about it, it shows them throwing, the, throwing this away, throwing that when they're trying to run from the, the anger of God when it comes in the form of natural disasters, um, their silver and their gold doesn't help them at all. But it says the righteousness 
righteousness delivereth from death all right in other words in the end if you even if you don't have much money when you die if you've been righteous in god's eyes then you will be delivered from spiritual damnation uh you know which is an eternal thing all right i i want us to write down here psalms 49 we're going to read six to eight psalms 49 from verse six to eight they that trust in their wealth and boast themselves in the multitude of their riches none of them can by any means redeem his brother nor give to God a ransom for him. For the redemption of their soul is precious and it ceaseth forever. That he should still live forever and not see corruption. Yeah. So it says, if you trust in your wealth, you want to boast in how much money you have. All right. But there's no way you can redeem a soul from going to hell you know, and pay for the price, at, nor can you give God a ransom for a person. You, you can do all you want. You can put them in the best hospital. You can spend a lot of money on them, but that's not going to help them after they die. The redemption of the soul is precious, all right? But your, your eternal spirit is worth far more than any amount of money. It says it's precious. And when it's gone, it's gone forever. There's no getting it back. There's no turning back. Let's read, you've read nine, read uh, to 13. 10 to 13. Yes. For he seeth that wise men die. Likewise, the fool and the brutish person perish and leave their wealth to others. Their inward thought is that their houses shall continue forever and their dwelling places to all generations. They call their lands after their own names. Nevertheless, man being in honor abideth not. He is like the beasts that perish. Yeah, in other words, there's no future. If you're building your future on this life, once you die, it's over with, it's finished, it's done, all right? At verse 13. This their way is their folly, yet their prosperity approve their sayings. All right. Their way is their folly. What is their way is to have a walk and a life without acknowledging God, without giving him the acknowledgement he needs to cry out to him and yield our life to him. So when you choose a way that is minus God, all right, it, it's your folly. It, it, it is bad for you. Oh, okay. Their post, posterity, that means their offspring. Yeah, even though they were like that, they will approve their sayings because the rest of them are the same. They don't realize we need God. This is why God told us, go into all the world and preach the gospel. There are people that don't know about the true and the living God. They know about God, but it's a God of their own making, a God that benefits them. It isn't a God that changes their life. It isn't a God that holds them accountable. It isn't the God who was their creator at all all right so let's read 16 to 18 of this same psalm but but sorry be not thou afraid when one is made rich when the glory of his house is increased for when he dieth he shall carry nothing away his glory shall not descend after him though while he lived he blessed his soul and men will praise thee when thou doest well to thyself. 19. He shall go to the generation of his fathers 
they shall never see light. Yeah, uh, there it is, very clear. This is what the Bible tells us. Do not base your life on false security. There's only one place of security, and that is in Christ, in the hollow of his hand. When we live for the temporal, as if there's no hereafter, all right? When we live as if the now, the here and the now is the most important, all right? That whole thing that we read, Psalms 49, is showing the difference of trusting God or trusting riches. God is the one that brought everything into being. God is the one that upholds everything. God is the one that meets every need that we have. But people think they don't need God. They think they're self-made. All right, but that is not so. All right, let's look at this Proverbs 11, 4. Oh, we read that one already, did we? Yeah, let's read Proverbs 1, uh, 29 to 32. 28, start with 28, sorry. Then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early but they shall not find me for that they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. They would none of my counsel. They despised all my reproof. Therefore shall they eat of the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own devices. For the turning away of the simple shall slay them and the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. But whoso hearkeneth unto me shall dwell safely and shall be quiet far from evil, far of evil. Sorry. Shall be quiet from fear of evil. Yes. So, you know, this is so clear. All right. Um, it, it's telling because today is the day of salvation. And yes, our God is a God of love, but there is a day of judgment coming. All right. And when people, don't want God. I, I, I'm thinking about that boy uh, whose father was a race car driver. He had divorced his wife. She loved God and the things of God. And um, he divorced her. And some children live with him. But this one boy lived with the mother. And as a teenager, he just didn't want to go to church, although the mother made him go to church. I, I need to say here, you cannot let your children decide. You say, they're already a teenager. Do you let them decide whether they can quit school or not? No, you make them go to school. So why do you think you shouldn't make them go to church? Till they're of age, then they make their own choices. But you have to ground them till they are of age. The law says that when they're of age, they can make their own choices. The Bible doesn't say that, but government says that. So, you know, and we wouldn't think of, I don't want to go to school anymore. I just want to laze around. Say, son, daughter, get there or you'll be sorry. You know, and we wouldn't take that at all. If they don't want to go to school, we make them go to school. But we think when it comes to church, well, they're a teenager. If they don't want to go, I can't make. Yes, the spiritual is far more important. Uh, you know, if, if you bring up a child in the way he's to go, you really put it in them. Even though they veer off, they will come back to it. We need to plant the seed into their heart. And so this portion of scripture is saying, these people didn't want to follow God, but when the bad things happened, all right, then they'll call on me. But he said, I'm not going to answer them. When they call on me, when it's too late, 
when it's not the day of salvation anymore, it's the day of destruction, it's the day of the wrath of God, they can say, oh, God, help me. And I was telling you about this uh, man who was a race car driver. And, and his boy that, that was with the mother that went to church, you know, he didn't want to go anymore. In fact, the pastor of that church was a big church in Oakland, California, but I knew the pastor. He's the one that told us this story. And he said, he and his friends would sit up in the balcony and make faces at the pastor. You know, like, eh, who wants to listen to you and da, 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 da. So one day he ran away from home. He ran to his father's house and said, I don't want to live with my mother anymore. She makes me go to church. And the father claimed to be an atheist. So he said, well, you stay with me. He said, dad, I want to be like you. I want to be a race car driver. And, but what he didn't realize is the father said, you can't be a race car driver till you learn the basics. And so he set him to cleaning the place where he kept the cars, race cars. You, you have to clean it. it. It was winter time. There was a little stove in the back of the um, work area and he was trying to he was told to clean the floor of all the grease and everything it was hard going and suddenly he he had a bottle of kerosene and it tipped over and spilled on the floor and he quickly picked it up but he noticed wow so easy to clean the floor with this so he just took that bottle of kerosene and purposely poured it all over, not thinking that the little wood stove in the corner, when the fumes fill the air and hit that stove, there was a loud explosion and that whole room caught on fire. Well, the floor was full of it. He hadn't been able to wipe it all up. And of course the fire got him as well. His clothes were on fire. He ran out the door. Um, cut a long story short, I think it was his brother uh, came down and you know threw him onto the grass and rolled him in the grass to try to put the fire out. But by then it had burnt his face, body, so forth. And the father came and got in one of his cars and literally became a race car driver. Uh, and he was going as fast as he could to try to get him to the hospital because of these terrible burns. And all the way there, he's crying, oh God, save my son. I mean, I thought you were an atheist. But when he was faced with this terrible disaster with his own child, innately he knew there was a God. Every one of us know down deep there is a God. And when we get into a terrible situation where we are not in control, the automatic thing is to start crying to God, even though we claim we don't believe in God. They got him there. He was put in the ICU ward. He was burnt so badly, and the pain was just excruciating. That he, they had to put something in him to be able to breathe because... Uh, the fire had ruined things, you know. The pastor went to visit him in the hospital and um, led the boy to the Lord. And the boy was able to communicate to that pastor. He said, oh, pastor, he said, it's terrible to be burned. Please tell my friends, it's terrible to be burned. And, you know, he accepted the Lord, but 
after that, he, he died. He passed away, passed away peacefully. At least he got his heart right with God. But the pastor told that story the next Sunday. And all those boys that were his, they all came to the altar. They wept and they cried. Because, friends, it isn't just religion. I get tired of hearing them talk about the Bible and religion. I want to be out in the world having fun, this, that, the other. My friend, the Bible is the only thing that tells us of the future, tells us what's going to take place, tells us how to make things right with God. All right. And it says, in that verse 32, in fact, it says, when they, they would none of my counsel, that's verse 30, they despised all my reproof. And the result is that they're going to eat the fruit of their own way. All right. There is a result to going your own way. Yes, you can enjoy. Yes, you can have fun. Yes, you can earn money. Yes, you can make your own decisions and so forth. But when it's over, you will be rewarded according to the way that you lived and walked. It says the turning away of the simple because they did not follow God's word. They followed what man told them. It will be their death. And those that are prosperous. Uh, full of prosperity, the fool that it will destroy them. But those that hearken to the Lord, all right, they will dwell safely, all right. Um, let's go down to number two. God wants us to prosper, all right. God's view of prosperity, all right. Um, I have given us here the definition of prosper in the Old Testament. It means to push forward, to break out, to come mightily. All right. The New Testament is to succeed in reaching, to succeed in business affairs. I'm going to give us. All right, First Chronicles, in fact, just a minute, I don't know. Before we do First Chronicles, I want you to put there Genesis 39, verse 3. Would you read that to us? Yes, Genesis 39, verse 3. And his master saw that the Lord was with him. And that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. Yeah. Now, this is taken from the story of Joseph when he was sold to Potiphar. He was sold as a slave and he had to do whatever his master told him. But in watching Joseph, Pot and Potiphar is not a believer like to, to know God, all right? He was not a Hebrew at all, but he saw that the Almighty, the Lord was with Joseph and everything that Joseph did, whatever Joseph put his hand to prospered. It just grew. It just did well. He made note of that. That was not over one day or a week. This was over a period of time. He noticed that whatever Joseph did turned out good. And he realized it was not natural because the boy is a slave. It isn't money. He realizes that the unseen God is with him and he put him over everything. In fact, we know that when Joseph later was thrown into prison because the wife lied about him, 
and uh, Potiphar didn't realize that she was lying and he had him thrown into prison there in prison, same thing. The keeper of the prison watched him and noticed everything he did turn good. God was there. God blesses those that acknowledge him and that yield their life to him. Now let's go to First Chronicles 22, verse 13. This is uh, David admonishing Solomon, his son. Then shalt thou prosper if thou takest heed to fulfill the statutes and judgments which the Lord charged Moses with concerning Israel. Be strong and of good courage. Dread not, nor be dismayed. Yeah, this is when David was going to let Solomon take over being king. He says, you will prosper in being king. You will do well. You will advance. You will make progress. You will succeed. You will be profitable if you will take heed. Be careful, in other words, to fulfill, not just know that they're there, not just know how to quote them, know how to find them in God's word, but you fulfill them. You put them into practice, what God charged Moses with, all right? It's going to you need to be strong and of good courage to do that, all right? It's not the world's way of doing things. Don't be afraid. Don't dread. Don't be dismayed because God's way will always be the best way. Now let's do Second Chronicles 26, verse 5. This has to do with King Uzziah. Second Chronicles 26, 5. And he sought God in the days of Zechariah, who had understanding in the visions of God. And as long as he sought the Lord, God made him to prosper. There it is. In the days of the prophet Zechariah, there was a king called King Uzziah. He had, un the Zechariah is the one that had understanding in the visions of God, the prophet. All right. But. It's King Uzziah as long because he sought God. The he is talking about King Uzziah. All right. As long as he sought the Lord, as long as King Uzziah sought the Lord, God made him to prosper. He is the king that, you know, he went to the throne, I think, at the age of 16. So the prophets were the ones that kind of taught him and took care of him. But when he got older and God had prospered him so much, pride came into his heart. And when pride came into his heart, he decided to take the place of the priests and offer incense to God. But in those days, the priests had their job, the prophets had their job, the kings had their job, and it was not the job of the king to do that. Only the priests could do it. And so the priest came and said to him, oh, king, you mustn't do that. It doesn't appertain to you. God hasn't given this to you. He gave this job to us today. And the king got angry. Whoa, how dare you talk to me? I'm the king. And when he got angry, immediately leprosy came in his forehead. And he was thrown out and lived in a leper's house till the day of his death. That's what it means. As long as he sought the Lord. As long as he obeyed what God told him. But when pride came in and he allowed anger to take over, that anger opened the door and he was smitten with leprosy. Whoa, I'm telling you, these things are for real. 
obeying God, doing what God wants, brings the blessings of God into our life. And when we turn away from that and give into our flesh, into our self-life, it opens the door for the devil to touch us and hurt us. So God's view of prosperity, all right, is to obey him and to do what he wants and he will cause us to prosper. God wants it. It's designed for the total man. That means um, it's not just your spiritual part. He wants to prosper us, body, soul, and spirit. Let's read that next one. Third John, there's only one chapter, verse 2. Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. All right. Our soul is our reasoning, our thinking, our will and our emotions, all right? He doesn't just want us as a personality to prosper, but he wants our body. I wish above all things, you may be in health as well. That prosperity goes for our body as well. God's desire is that we should be healthy. God's desire is not that we should be sick. And it is even as your soul prospereth, as you begin to know God more and more in your thinking, in your reasoning, in yielding your will to him, uh, in your emotions, allowing God to rule over your emotions, that all has a part to play in our bodily health. May God help us to understand that, all right. It's designed for the total man, material blessing that you may be, that you may prosper. Health for the body, which is outward, is based on the inward. Prosperity of the soul, seems to be the gauge, all right? That is walking in the truth, which is walking in obedience. Um, notice that 1 Thessalonians 5, 23, would you read that for us? Yes, 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 23. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved, blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. All right. The very God of peace. God is here called a God of peace. Sanctify you. Set you apart from sin. Set you apart unto God. Holy. That means in every part of you. Completely not just your spirit, all right? I pray, God, your whole... Notice it starts here with the inward, the internal. Your spirit, your soul, your body. We always say body, soul, and spirit. We start from the outside. But when it comes to being healthy, God starts from the inside, your whole spirit. Then next is your soul, and last but not least, your body to be preserved blameless, all right, that there's no fault in any area. Again, let me say, your spirit is that part of you, which, you know, when you're in sin, the Bible says you were dead in trespasses and sins. True health starts when we come to God, all right? And our, we're given a brand new spirit. We're made a member of the body of Christ, all right? 
and then we are made alive in our spirit, no longer dead because of sin, then our soul begins to change. That takes a lifetime of becoming more and more, all right, uh, like Jesus, all right, um, changed from glory to glory, to be more like God every day in our thinking, in reasoning, our outlook, all right, in our, what, what is the will, all right. Jesus said, mm, my will is to do the will of him who sent me. I don't want to do my own will. I want to do the will of him that sent me. I don't belong to myself. I came here to obey God. And when he comes into us and brings us into him, he wants us to have that same attitude. Not my will, but thy will be done. All right. And then last but not least, all right, the, the will the emotions, all, all of that is your soul. I told you in the very beginning when I was young, I had a terrible anger, all right? God has through the years mellowed me down, all right? It doesn't mean I'm not capable. I'm still capable, but it isn't as often that that would take place. He's done a great change in me. When I don't need any more changing, he's going to take me. So as I'm living a long life, I guess, because God says there's still a lot more to be done in you, my daughter. So I'll let you stay alive till you change more and more to be like me. When you're ready to come up here, I'll bring you up there. All right. And then our bodies. All right. And let's, real, let's not accept old age as a reason why our bodies just you know kerflui no we can realize god wants us to be in health all right and and if we just take life as it comes uh we're going to accept whatever comes our way i'm thinking right now of those five old ladies i i read this story out of the book called A More Excellent Way, written by um, Wright, W-R-I-G-H-T. I've forgotten, forgotten his name. And he, Henry, Henry Wright. Wright. Yeah, Henry Wright. He's already gone to heaven. But in his book, he tells this story of these five older ladies, and they were all their fingers were and knuckles were you know, rheumatism bent over like that. And uh, they came to him after they had heard him preach or teach. And they said, oh, Pastor Wright, would you pray for us? He, he told them, he said, I want you to do one thing before I pray for God to heal you. And that is you go look in your heart, all of you, and you choose to forgive each and every person that has hurt you, harmed you, lied to you, done wrong to you, shamed you, made you angry. I'm putting all those words. He, he just said, you know, whoever you need to forgive, if they've hurt you or done things to you, shamed you, whatever it is, choose to forgive them. So all five of them bowed their heads and began to choose to forgive as faces and names came to them. And one by one, as they finished praying, all right, he didn't have to pray for them, all of them, their hands straightened out. The reason they were so crippled was because of unforgiveness in their heart. So this is what I'm trying to tell you, that our bodies, uh, let your body be in health, even as your souls prosper. When we're harboring things in ourself, the soul part of us, and we're not doing what God wants us to do, uh, it affects our bodies. 
when we eat wrongly, it affects our bodies. When we, yeah, we, we just need to realize, all right, he wants us to the God of peace, sanctify you completely. All right. And I pray God that your whole spirit, soul, body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's read. Um, I'm going to put this under first Thessalonians Colossians 3 15. Colossians 3 verse 15. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts to the which also ye are called in one body and be ye thankful. Yes. So let means you have to allow it. We make choices. We're responsible for the choices in our life. All right. And it says God has given you his peace in your heart. Jesus is called the Prince of Peace. And it means he's sitting on the throne. As long as Jesus is sitting on the throne of your heart, you will have peace in your hearts. Now allow that peace of God to rule in your hearts. When your peace leaves, all right, immediately don't wait. Say, God, what have I said, done, thought? Uh, something has happened that I've lost my peace. Get it under the blood and get Jesus back on the throne. The moment you do something, think something, and allow that thought to remain or motive or whatever you're doing, um, action, deed, words that come out of the mouth, if they're not right and you don't get it right, peace will be gone. You won't have peace. You'll know it yourself. There, The peace isn't there. Don't argue. Just Confess it. If it's something you said or did to people, go to them, ask them to forgive you, acknowledge you are wrong. Don't blame them for the way you responded. If you responded in a wrong way, just go to them, ask for forgiveness. All right. And it says, so allow that peace to be the thermometer of your life, the barometer of your living. All right. And it says you've been called in one body. That means to be at peace one with another. That's what that's talking about. Let peace rule in your heart, but also be at peace one to another. The fact God put you into the body of Christ as a member of Christ. There's other members in that body. And when you get out of sorts with one of them, I don't care what excuse you give, how they treated you, what they've done to you, but if they are one of God's children and you are out of sorts with them, then it's wrong and it will affect you in your life. You won't be able to get your healing. So you need to think clearly and carefully. Another thing is be ye thankful. Don't just say it with your mouth. Be is from within you. Being thankful, being grateful, instead of complaining, murmuring, finding fault with things and people and circumstances in your life. Being thankful is so important. It's like a watchdog in our life. Well, you know what? I'm not going to go to number three uh, because we still have also uh, another part to this. Um, yeah, there's another page, page three. So we will do number three and then we will go right on. God wants us to prosper. All right. And we will start with B. This is 
A that we've done so far, two portions of A, God's view of prosperity, one and two. We'll end up with three next time and then go on over to uh, B and try to finish that. God bless you as we bow our heads and close our eyes. Father, right now, open the eyes of our understanding. I thank you for that day that you began to open my eyes. I didn't realize things were so important to me. They were more important to me than souls. I ask you to forgive me. And you have been working on this in my life ever since. Lord, I just pray if there are others in this class that maybe they don't realize it like I didn't realize it. It's so important that you must be first. And if we are not putting you first, but we're just not understanding it, then let us go through some situation that will open our spiritual eyes where you can speak to us because we need to be awakened before it's too late. Because like you said, you cannot serve God and mammon. You cannot serve God and money. There is a God of money and we don't want to serve that God. It comes from satanic sources. We want to serve the God of creation, the God of love, the God who so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Lord, I just pray that you will speak to our hearts today. And as we pray before you will yield ourselves completely to you and allow you to take over in every area of our life. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. I give you the praise and the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Bye-bye. See you on Saturday, Lord willing as we go back to the book of Isaiah, okay.